Um, so thank you so much for joining me today at the end of uh, a long day filled with some fairly heavy material uh, on AI and machine learning. Um, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of a break from that. Um, and we're gonna talk about the essential role that being a analytics translator plays in the modern workforce and how adopting that role can help you really get your work noticed and help you become more of an influencer through your work. So in our brief time together today, um, I wanna just talk about why data can't always be our first priority and understanding why we need to really consider our audience and design with our audience in mind. Then we'll take a look at how we drive action through translating analysis and making sure that we're really keeping our stakeholders' needs in mind. And then how we can just make small changes to invite your audience in to your expertise, to not leave them out there as, uh, as outsiders wondering what in the world you're talking about, but how a few changes can really help you build a much larger conversation uh, and people in your conversation and really help uh, connect with stakeholders. Um, and then we'll have a chance for some, some Q&A at the end. So just keep in mind that if our goal is to have a dialogue with stakeholders and decision makers, we can't start with the data. And part of that is because not everyone speaks data. Um, so you know, just think about your experience the past couple of days, maybe last week. Um, did you have a conversation about data with someone who doesn't speak that language fluently? Um, think about how that went. Was that person just sort of appropriately nodding when they thought they should and making those mm-hmm sounds, but not really engaging and asking questions? Maybe their focus was on another screen or you could see them sort of like pulling their cell phone up uh, from, from their desk. It's because speaking data is a challenge and no one who is in a leadership position in an organization likes to feel like they don't get something, but often that happens with data. So let me just share with you uh, what it's like for someone who doesn't speak data to wander in to a conversation with you and your team. Oh, here we go. This is super cute if you've never watched the entire uh, like two minute clip. But these two babies have a conversation in their own language that no one else understands. They're having a great time. They're laughing, they're telling jokes, right? But the adults who are filming this have no idea what they're saying. And this is the position we unfortunately, oops, and unintentionally, put our stakeholders in when we just start spewing data language and using our jargon with them, we have a conversation or not even a conversation, they sort of watch what's going on without being able to interact. And our goal is to change that by really taking on the role of being a data translator. And that's really what we want to aim to be. And before I go any deeper into this talk, I do feel like I should come clean to you. I would not consider myself a data scientist. I am middling at best in R and Python. I'm pretty sure even if you gave me $1,000, I could not accurately tell you what a neural net is. But I am a numbers person. And that means that I crave to understand data and its patterns. But I'm not you know, an expert in creating visualizations or complicated programs that really do deep analysis. I am a data enthusiast though, and a dedicated data translator. And that makes me a valuable part of an organization because that means I've learned to speak both languages, 
the language of data, which I respect, and I respect everyone who's doing very technical work with it. And I can translate that to the side of the business that doesn't understand that and get those two pieces talking to one another, right? So if you're in this room right now with me, I imagine you're either very much into data scientists, uh, data science, excuse me, or you prescribe a real importance to sharing data. So I don't need to preach this to you, but let's think about everyone who's not in this room with us. Our bosses and our teammates who sort of cringe when we start talking about data, uh, your partner or your spouse or your roommate who really doesn't care about what you did all day because it bores them. Um, we need to think about ourselves as data translators if we want our work to be understood and celebrated by those people who are not in the room with us because those people are often our audience and the decision makers who can help push our work forward. So what we need to do without simplifying the complex ways that we work with data or dumbing down what we learn from data, we need to translate our work into something that is meaningful and understandable to our less data fluent colleagues. I spent 10 years teaching high school math in New York City. And in this role, I learned very, very quickly that a fluency in math and numbers did not equip me to be a math teacher. In fact, my numeracy actually made it made me a very difficult teacher to learn from because I didn't realize that I needed to interpret a language that was so understandable to me into something my students could understand. And that's a position where many of us find ourselves when we share data. Okay? So taking time to consider the level of translation we need for a non-data person to understand our work is the first step in being able to move your work from informing to influencing. And this guy here was me for many, many years. And what I finally realized is that decision makers didn't want me to just go run off and play with data. As interesting as that was for me, um, as cool of relationships that I could find, that's not what they were looking for. They wanted me to really sit down with them, understand their business challenges, and then go back to the data to find a way to inform possible solutions to those challenges. Right? This is why so many data projects fail to live up to expectations because we don't do this piece of stopping and thinking about our stakeholders and decision makers and what's actually gonna drive value for them. Instead, we dive head first into the data, looking for something interesting to us. And unfortunately, that's not the piece that always carries value for the business. Understanding what your decision makers comfort level is with data, with tools, with jargon, is of utmost importance in knowing what level of translation your work needs. And what we don't wanna do is make any assumptions about the underlying knowledge of a process or a program that our audience may have. And we wanna be crystal clear about the impact and results of our analysis, not just give them our analysis, but the why our analysis is important and what we can do with it. And by making those strategic decisions about how to have those conversations with stakeholders, you're going to aid your audience's understanding and by engaging them in a conversation that makes sense and that they can be an equal partner in is the first step in really thinking about how to influence through your data. And part of that might be your approach to solving problems. So the way you approach a problem, the way you approach going into a big data set can make all of the difference in translating your results. Right? So again, I am the first to admit that I love trying a small, uh, trying to find a small, obscure, and interesting relevation in a big data set. But that approach takes time, and it focuses on again what we're interested in, rather than trying to consider the problem that this data can help us solve or this challenge that it can help us address. And so let's just take a look at how focusing on the analysis and focusing on the results and not necessarily our audience can sometimes get in our way. And we're gonna do that by looking at what is an almost daily challenge in my house, uh, what to have for dinner. So uh, 
my husband Ryan and I, I wish we were better meal planners. We're not. It often comes to the end of the evening and we sort of look at each other and we're like, ugh, what are we going to eat tonight? And so Ryan in this case is my stakeholder, um, my decision maker, my funder. Uh, he's the one who really needs to make the decision about dinner because uh, he's pickier than I am. Um, and he's given me these parameters here that whatever we eat needs to be delicious and reasonably priced. Okay, well, there's a lot that I could do with that information, right? It's a pretty broad problem. So in order to help me figure out how to share the possibilities with him in a way that can help us make a decision, I'm gonna break it down with an issue tree and thinking about what we can have for dinner and what my different options are for how we come to a final decision. So we could cook something or someone else could cook. And I'm gonna make the executive decision that we go with someone else cooks, I'm not feeling it, right? Ryan's not feeling it tonight. So then if someone else is cooking, that leaves me two options. We order in or we dine out. I live in New York City. Uh, we just sort of opened restaurants up inside and it's getting a little cold outside. So actually the idea of dining out is not that appealing to me. So I'm gonna eliminate that and we're gonna order in. So, okay, take out. Well, I can continue to limit this problem space, reduce the number of options I have by thinking about how long it takes for the food to be delivered. Is it 30 minutes or less than 30 minutes? And knowing my audience, who's Ryan, who's already a little bit skeeved out by this whole process I'm putting together to help us make a database decision about dinner, I know that he starts to get cranky the longer he goes without dinner. And so I'm gonna pick the quickest delivery time possible and what inevitably comes down to in New York is, do we eat pizza or not pizza for dinner? And in this case, I'm gonna go with pizza. So all of that work to sort of narrow down where I need to focus my search for data on a possible solution that's going to bring value to my stakeholder, which is food quickly that we don't have to cook, but still allowing me to jump into the data to help make a decision. So we're gonna go with pizza. At this point, Ryan is rolling his eyes at me, right? He just wants to order pizza. And I say, no, we have to make the best decision possible about the pizza we eat. And so I go to Uber Eats and I just scrape some data real quick for the local pizza places that will deliver in under 30 minutes to us. And this might be your process. You go, you find the data you need, then you gotta clean up the data a little bit, make sure that you're working uh, with numeric data, you might go find some additional data. In this case, I text my friend Dave, who I totally trust his opinion on food, and he tells me what he recommends in our, our area. Then again, do a little cleaning, convert that. And so now I've got my data and I need to go into analysis form. So thinking about what I need here, uh, going and adding a total cost for how much this two pizzas is gonna cost us, um, including the food and the delivery fee, um, maybe getting an average so that Ryan can have some baseline numbers to compare his choice to. Um, and I like to feel pretty certain uh, that these, the, the ratings we're looking at are accurate. So I just calculate a quick confidence interval as people do when they're deciding to have dinner. And now I've done my analysis and I bring this to Ryan, who is my stakeholder and say, here, you decide, what do we have for dinner? Here's all the information at your fingertips. What do you think his reaction is? We are, in his eyes, nowhere closer to ordering dinner than when we started. And in fact, he just waited for me to, <laughs> to validate this database approach. And the problem here is I haven't translated my analysis into something that's easy for him to use to make a decision. I haven't embraced what being a data translator means in this last step of trying to share my insights. So no one needs to or wants to really figure this out based on a table. So I'm gonna give him a little bit of a visual. I'm gonna make a scatter plot here, uh, comparing the average star rating from Uber Eats to how much it costs. And Brian said it had to be delicious and reasonably priced. So I'm definitely going to get rid of my upper left quadrant where things are more expensive than average and less delicious than average. 
right? We can wipe those out. So that helps make a decision. But I'm still making Ryan work. He doesn't have time for this. He's getting hangry, right? This whole analysis is pretty weird. So what I need to do is think about how I translate what I think the best choice is and give him a couple options of why. And it might just be adding a little narrative to help him understand why I've made these choices, right? So we have our, in this case, basil, maybe you thought that as you're looking at the table as well, is in fact our top choice for dinner. And if for some reason they take longer to deliver than 30 minutes, we might wanna go with Pizza Nostra, but that does lack Dave's key endorsement. And here, Ryan can visualize all the possibilities and rationalize why these are the options I'm giving to him. And that's what we do as translating, right? As a data translator, as an analytics translator, we have that essential role of making sure our audience can use our analysis to make a decision and understand it and feel good about it. And so we wanna move people to action. And we're concerned about bigger problems than pizza and certainly are working with bigger data sets. But that approach of sharing our results in a way that's easy to understand is the essential component of being an analytics translator. And that's how you can help make sure that you and your stakeholders are speaking the same language. So I'm gonna share just a couple of other ways for you to consider your analysis and visuals that will help you move towards speaking a more common language with your audience. And the first is to consider the fact that your analysis is interesting to you, not necessarily to everyone. So you might do an analysis and you come up after doing a random forest analysis, here's your mean decreased accuracy and you share it and you say here, now you know what we need to do, right? If your audience is perhaps the manager of a bank, right, or the head of a bank who probably doesn't know this type of analysis, this is absolutely useless to them. They have no idea how to read this mean decreased accuracy or what the impact of removing one of these variables might be. So just add a little common language. Tell them what it means upfront in writing so they can think about it and understand it and then have a conversation with you. Okay. Small things translate into a language they understand. Same thing here. We have a really complicated results from a regression model. Very few people outside of your data team know how to read this or want to read this. So think about what's important here. In this case, this was the analysis done on the number of dropped calls for people who left a telco service versus people who stayed. Well, here's the key insight here that churned customers averaged almost two more dropped calls a month. That's what's important from what looks like a super crazy output to someone who doesn't know how to read it. And taking that extra step, doing that translation means you can start to have a conversation and your analysis can start to move uh, decision makers and have an impact. Okay. All right. We also want to always be reducing the cognitive load of our audience. We actually want them to think the least amount possible about what we're sharing with them, which I know sounds counterintuitive, right? We also, we often want to be thought provoking or put that idea out there that people need to chew on for a bit. But a general rule when sharing information with a mixed audience is to always aim to reduce their cognitive load. Remove the need for them to make sense of your charts and do the heavy lifting of interpretation. And even if you are presenting to a more technical audience, if you're presenting on a data set they've never seen before, you need to help them understand the data that you yourself have been immersed in, right? Think about what they need to understand. And the reason we need to do that is a lot of the visuals we put out in the world or default visualizations that come out of our dashboards and our visualization software don't have that, I, that, that default reducing the cognitive load. If you just present this to a mixed audience, how are they supposed to read it? How are they supposed to make a decision about it? Right? Your job is to figure out what that trend is and share it. And so we come across so many visualizations that people think are fun and cool and show their point but in fact, they're actually very difficult to quickly grasp and understand, and they need to be translated, right? These get worse and worse. 
info, uh, this, is, this is sort of infographic-y, right? But we've gotten so complex in trying to just be cute, the overall importance gets lost. And just for fun, I'm gonna share with you uh, what I think is the most awful of bad charts I've ever seen. Here's my 3D bar chart about banana exports that somehow also has a banana background, right? Bad, bad charts. <laughs> and they're not necessarily bad because they're overly complicated, right? In this case, they're certainly overly complicated. But sometimes bad charts are bad because they don't invite someone into a conversation. And we might be trying to share charts that are great for exploratory data analysis, when really what we're trying to do is explain to our audience. And you can't be certain that your audience knows how to read a Sankey or an area chart or even a box and whisker plot, right? It may have been, I don't know, 25 years since they've taken a basic statistics class. So a general rule of thumb is when possible, and I know this case isn't true for all data sets, but if you can stick to line charts, bar charts, and scatter plots to explain your data, you're going to invite more people into that conversation than if you had chosen a complicated visual that they don't know how to understand. Because right? no one likes to feel dumb when they're looking at data. So if we simplify and use common charts that they're comfortable with, we've already reduced their barrier to entry into the conversation. We want to also invite our audience to experience our expertise. And so this is, this is a little old, uh, but Luke Benz uh, is, he's written some great R programs that uh, anyone who's a, co a college sports fanatic could really appreciate. Um, and this is an example of one. So he wrote a program that calculates the winning percentage for two teams playing against each other in basketball. And he often tweets out the results. And my husband, Ryan, who we just chose what pizza place to order from with, uh, he's a huge UNC fan. And he and his buddies have this group chat. And last February, he came to me and he said, Deidre, what does this even mean? It looks good, but how do I interpret it? Right? And so this win probability chart does look good. It has symmetry. It's aesthetically pleasing. But Ryan, who, by the way, is an accountant, but he's, he's also sort of a numbers person, just not a data person, had no idea how to read it. And so I thought this is a great opportunity. Luke Benz forgot that his audience might not understand this chart. And so this was a perfect opportunity for me to do a little translation by thinking about my audience, which in this case is Ryan and everyone else on that group chat, and thinking about what was really important for them to know. So I could remove Duke's probability of winning because these two are just inverses of each other, right? It's an unnecessary data point and really focus on what it means to call out what was happening in the game for my audience of UNC fans. And again, adding a little narrative to make it clear. And so this, this was a crazy game that Carolina lost twice, uh, basically by uh, having last minute buckets put in by Duke. It was a super stressful game. But now we have a visual that speaks to the audience, that speaks to what they needed to know, where it was much harder when we were looking at that win probability chart, right? It already just looks too technical, even though those two charts say the same thing. And so finally, in considering your audience and considering your message, considering your translation, there are many, many different ways that you can go with helping your audience understand what they need to move forward. Um, and so I, I teach data storytelling, but I, analytics and data translator, they all fall into the same umbrella of just helping people better understand and make better decisions and be moved by data. And so I'm going to tell you here that data storytelling can actually improve your life a little bit. Here's finally a picture of Ryan. I know you've heard a lot about him during this talk, uh, but it's, it's a good subject matter uh, to get a little, little break from businessy things. Um, so what I did is I put together a very one-sided data collection of what it is like to live with Ryan. And again, totally one-sided, not very scientific. I've plotted the habit that he does in terms of like living with him, how often he does it, it's a little bit of a bubble chart here, and what the level of enjoyment that brings to me. 
And when I think about translating this data to someone, right, I have some options. So I've just met all of you. And I'm going to certainly tell you, oops, oh, I missed a slide here. Well, <laughs> there are a couple of versions we could go with. I was going to show you the one where we highlight how great he is uh, and highlighting this top left quadrant here. But for some reason, that slide is hidden. So instead, we'll look at the second version where if Ryan's my audience, if I need to translate for him what he should take out of this data, I'm going to have him focus on this bottom left quadrant the things that drives me crazy that he does. And I'm gonna make a move. I'm gonna translate some of my language into his. So before it was minimal effort, maximal effort. I'm gonna make it easy for him. Is it easy? Is it hard? And then I had it before on a scale of enjoyable to irritating. And quite frankly, after 10 years together, I'm pretty sure Ryan does not care if he irritates me. In fact, that might be his goal sometimes. And so I need to change the language I use so he understands the level of seriousness of what I'm talking about here. So instead of irritating, I'm going to go with grounds for divorce. Right? Small changes for your audience, changes from your jargon, changes from abbreviations your team makes, but ways that you can consider bringing outsiders in to your data so that they can talk to you about it. Right? Uh, so this has, this time has flown by. Um, so as we think about translating uh, for all audiences, um, everyone can do this with a little bit of practice and making sure that you focus on your audience. Ask the right question before you dive right into the data, because that's going to help you stay out of rabbit holes. Making sure you consider how to share your analysis visually with the right level of translation to help someone come to a decision or to understand the impact of what you're sharing. And most importantly, going in with the mindset of embracing the role of being a translator. It's just a little extra work, but it opens up so many more doors for you. So my time is just about up. Uh, please don't be a stranger. Feel free to connect uh, with me on LinkedIn or reach out to me. Uh, my email address is there. And I have just a couple of minutes, uh, I believe, for Q&A if there are any questions people have um, about being a translator before it looks like there's a keynote coming on after this.